Hey everyone, today is part two of my talk with Betty Lou Sandy from Betty Lou's Gardening. We talk about fall cleanup and how to winter garden here in New England. Even if you don't live in the area, you can still use the information where you are now. So stay tuned. This is Living and Loving Herbs podcast. This episode is brought to you by farmtobath.com, where our bath and body products are inspired by nature. Farm to Bath makes beautiful handcrafted goat smoke soaps, body and room sprays, sugar scrubs, salves, balms, body oils, using the herbs, flowers, fruits, and vegetables grown in our gardens. There are no preservatives, additives, dyes, or fillers. We use sustainable growing practices that are chemical and GMO free. So make sure you check out farmtobath.com. This episode is brought to you by My Garden Journal, a how-to garden book for kids. Gardening is a learned skill and everybody has to start somewhere. This journal provides the best way to improve your gardening skills to ensure more success and fewer failures. The intent of this journal is to simultaneously teach basic gardening techniques while providing a place to record your journey with important information about the how, when, and where to grow food and flowers. There are suggestions on theme gardens such as a Harry Potter garden, a young chef's garden, or a monarch butterfly superhero garden for budding naturalists and a place to either sketch or photograph your plants to remember their appearance in the next growing season. You'll be amazed at how much you'll learn about journaling about your garden. This book is available in paperback and ebook formats. You can find it in most retail and online stores such as Amazon, Barnes & Noble, draft to digital Kobo, Google iBooks, and local libraries. If you don't find the book, please ask them to order it for you. It is available. If you don't want to wait for the paperback book to arrive, you can download a printable version directly from me at my author website, brendajsullivanbooks.com. That's B. R E N D A J S U L L I V A N B O O K S dot com. Click on the picture and scroll down to the bottom for the PayPal link and follow the prompts. And while you're there, check out all our other books available. Hello, I'm Brenda Sullivan, and this is Living and Loving Herbs podcast, where I discuss different ways you can use herbs, whether it's using them for health purposes, culinary purposes, growing them in your garden, using them in bath and body products, or creating a chemical-free home. I'll share with you its traditions and history, because who doesn't love a good story? If I find a book related to the subject, resources that might be helpful, I'll share them with a link under book recommendations and reference links found in the show notes. The goal of this show is to mystify herbs, their uses, and make them easier for you to incorporate them into your daily life. I've also started a newsletter called Five Herb Friday. Every Friday, I'll send out a quick email uh, about a variety of topics related to herbs or what happened to be doing that week. It could be book recommendations or any research that I'm doing for a future podcast. It'd be seasonal reminders on when it's time to make certain herbal remedies a cool gadget that I happen to be using and recommend, uh, seasonal herbal uh, folklore. Uh, we just did a, a little uh, story about the fall and the red leaves and that it's the best time to view the Big Dipper. I love little snippets like that. Tools that I may be using uh, and recommend, and a variety of other things. In addition, once a month, I'll post a plant profile about an herb. This profile gives you information about its how it's grown, harvested, its uses, safety concerns, and dosages, because every herbalist must learn their botany. And as I do my research and continue with my advanced studies, um, I have to create plant profiles. So 
why not share my class homework with you? The newsletters are upbeat topics that are bite-sized, so it's easy to read and understand. You can scan them on your phone. And then you go into your weekend just being a little bit wiser about the herbs. It's a great way to stay connected to me as I learn about all the wonderful things herbs uh, can do for you. So just click on the link in the show notes and hop over to LLH website and sign up for Five Herb Fridays. Today is part two of my interview with Betty Lou Sandy. In this section, she does a quick review of what she talked about in part one, and then she goes on and talks about indoor gardening, prepping your lawn, shrubs and trees for the winter, including how to take care of conifers or pine trees, if you don't know what a conifer is. If you missed part one, it's episode number 10, so you can go back and check that out and listen. But before we get started, I just want to give you a little personal update. As I record this right now, it's raining. Yay! It's raining. Um, If you haven't heard, the Northeast is in a severe drought and we live on a well. And we've been very diligent about conserving water. If you live with us, well, you know, um, we're not taking showers every day. They've been spaced out to every three to four days. Uh, We're not watering the garden. We're only doing full loads of dishes and laundry, which means, yeah, my dishes don't get done almost um, maybe every other day. Maybe. I don't know. It depends on how much cooking I do, which hasn't been a whole lot because we don't want to use a lot of water. The last thing we want to do is run our well dry and have uh, Charlie's water wagon rescue us. Uh, We're seeing Charlie roll up the street in his huge 18-wheeler tanker trucks fully loaded of water. Um, They come rumbling up the hill on their way to deliver water to houses that are above us and are behind us. Uh, We normally see this guy in the spring when the pools need to be filled, but seeing him this late in the season means only one thing. Somebody's well is dry, and the number of times we're seeing him drive up the hill and back down in a day means there are a lot of houses out of water. Yeah, that's a scenario we want to avoid. Running a well dry could damage appliances because of the sediment at the bottom of the well. You know, that gets pumped through your plumbing and could cause a whole set of problems with your appliances. And we really want to avoid that. We ran our well dry once and I'll never want to do that ever again. So yeah, we are thrilled. Uh, my husband Paul is was doing a little rain dance uh, this morning when it was just pouring. Um, so yeah, we we are very relieved that it's raining. In other news, I interviewed Teresa Valendez last week. Teresa is the owner of Ultraform and is a self care advocate and health coach. She is a friend of mine. I've known her for years, and we talked about self care and what it means. As we did, and we did a deep dive on the pressures of being uh, a modern woman and all the stuff that goes along with that, and what that means, and why some of us, uh, me, are, are feeling really overwhelmed. Uh, We also did a little five-minute mindfulness exercise in my garden. I have to say it was a really cool experience. It was a great centering exercise, and um, we recorded this. So we'll be sharing it not only on the LLH website, but also on her website, ultraform.com, soon. So I will let you know when that's available. I just have to uh, do the editing portion of it. And yes, we were not alone in the garden. Um, You'll hear some little vocal chipmunks and blue jays offering their two cents during the interview. It was pretty funny. One little chippy wasn't uh, far from us, and he was chip, chip, chipping away while she was trying to talk. It was was pretty funny. So the show will be available in a couple of weeks. Uh, It's in the editing process at the moment. Uh, Katie and I have had a busy couple of weekends painting our next activity book. This is part of a series that I've been working on uh, doing uh, activity books with nature themes. Uh, This one is going to be called Counting Autumn Leaves. I have a picture in the show notes of us, uh, of some of the artwork that we did uh, behind the scenes. Uh, The book needed 40 paintings of leaves. 
Now I have to sit down and cut each painting out and scan them into the computer and manipulate them with some computer magic and make a book out of it. It's a lot of work, but Katie, I have to say, my baby girl, and she loves to sit next to me while I work on the computer and watch uh, me turn her paintings into books. She, she, believe it or not, she really likes it. And she gets even more excited when I am able to hand her a physical book and say, look, this is what we did together. And uh, she really gets a kick out of that. I've done the second edition uh, is done for the counting uh, starfish. I had to move some things around and updated some of the legal stuff like websites and contact information that goes in the front of the book. I had originally created that book several years ago in PowerPoint as a class project, and it really needed to be done over and formatted and in design so uh, I could go wide with the book. Right now, it's just exclusively with Amazon. And I, I really need to go wide with, with these books. So I'm uh, still learning uh, the power or not the PowerPoint, the InDesign software program. There's a long learning curve, uh, but I'm getting there. Uh, there's so much to learn when you decide to go digital. I'm, you know, I'm always behind, but I'm getting catching up. I, I'm going to get caught up. I, I'm determined. Um, in September, I finished the two other counting books, which will be out soon, Counting Snowflakes and Counting Dragonflies. I just need someone to look them over to make sure that I didn't miss anything. You know, like a, a dragonfly on number 10, you know, I only have nine. <laughs> it says counting 10 dragonflies. I only have nine on the page, things, little things like that. So as soon as I have uh, my editor look at that, um, we'll, we'll put, get those out. So in other nudes, I've been starting some new tinctures, soaking tinctures and with herbs that I haven't tried yet. Today, I decanted blue vervain, which is a great nervine uh, from what I've been reading. Uh, nervines are a class of herbs that relax muscles and, you know, kind of relieve that general irritability. If you're a woman, you know what I'm talking about. So um, I... Uh, Probably we'll do a show on a group of ner nervines that are common uh, that we don't think about as, well, maybe you, you didn't realize that they're relaxing and calming or didn't know why they were relaxing and calming. So I'm thinking of also doing a class, an online class on tinctures and how to make them. And uh, maybe I'll do a focus on maybe two or three herbs uh, making them into tinctures and decanting them and what they're all about and then doing plant profiles. So if this is something you're interested in, please let me know. Uh, you can post your answer or interest on either the Instagram, Living and Loving Herbs podcast Instagram, or on Facebook. And again, these links will be in the show notes. So please, seriously, please let me know if this is something you're interested in learning about. And that's my update for now. I hope you enjoy the second half of my interview with Betty Lou Sandy from Betty Lou's Gardening. Betty Lou is a garden consultant and instructor in all things gardens and lawns. She is also the garden coordinator for Spruce Street Community Garden in Manchester, Connecticut, and does historical garden and history at the Cheney Homestead Museum in Manchester, Connecticut. Like I've always been saying, Betty Lou is a treasure trove of information about gardens, so make sure you grab a notebook and take notes, or better yet, hop over to the LLH website, because Betty Lou has graciously given you her notes from her gardening classes, and you can download them for free and follow along. At the end of the interview, I'll have the list of of her upcoming videos she is scheduled to do on the Spruce Street Community Facebook Garden page. So make sure you check that out, and I hope you enjoy the show. Okay, we're back. We had to take a quick little break. Um, I had to stoke the fire, and uh, we need to get a, a little cup of tea. So we're going to kind of recap on where we are uh, in our in our list here. Um, so Betty Lou, why don't you kind of go back over, um, let's stick with the, the 
winter gardening for now, and then we'll flip over to fall garden cleanup. Okay. And all the other stuff. So we we were talking about um, the winter gardening starts in late August. Yes. Winter gardening usually starts in late August when you're planting all your cold crops, your cold weather hardy crops, such as broccoli, Brussels sprouts, kale, um, your carrots, parsnips, all kinds of wonderful good things. Uh, rhubarb is something that is a perennial. And I usually get a good spring crop, a fall crop, and if I'm watering it well, I'll even get some in the summertime. Egyptian onions, that's got four different um, harvests to it. Um, starting with the chives early in the spring, usually late February, uh, early March, and through the spring until it starts getting woody. And then uh, it starts building its bulb onions on the top of the stems, which uh, are called pearl onions. They're very sweet and tender. Then, um, so what do you do with those? You cut them off. You clip them. You take them off. You can pickle them. You can you can use them in stir fry. You can dice them up, um, or you can use them as seeds to plant more Egyptian onions. Okay. Matter of fact, in many countries, they're called walking onions. Because um, if you don't harvest those pearl onions, they will bend over and plant themselves, and you get more uh, plants coming up. And, That's cool. Um, I really like those. Yeah, I love them too. Matter of fact, um, after the pearl onions and the stalks, those woody stalks will die back, but then you get chives again. And at this time of year, there are loads of chives available from the Egyptian onions, as well as being able to transplant all kinds of them. Um, you can also pick, harvest the um, uh, bulb of the, it's an, an elongated bulb, which is an onion, and it's very sweet. So you can use that in your cooking as well, a sweet onion. that's uh, And they're practically free because they keep replenishing themselves. Yeah. I consider that one of the winter uh, crops also because it will provide your um, chives through the, through the fall. And then as soon as you're able to see them coming up through the snow or the leaves, you have more chives in the springtime. In the early spring, if you're growing your own food, you're going to want some greens. So um, you look for the, the chives, the, the kale. <laughs> broccoli. Broccoli will keep going until uh, April. Okay. Even when it goes to, to, see, to flower. The yellow flowers taste like broccoli, and they're pretty in your salads. Um, and the same thing with the uh, Brussels sprouts. They're mm -hmm. in the same family, the brachia, and they'll have they'll go to flower, and those taste just like broccoli. Can you sprout a head of broccoli from the grocery store? No. Okay. Because it has to go to seed. And the grocery store broccoli usually doesn't go to seed. It's best if it stays in the ground and keeps going. Okay. Um, now, you're not going to get a head of broccoli in the wintertime. You're going to get sprigs of broccoli. Okay. And they're tender and juicy and sweet. Okay. And Same. garlic. What about garlic? Ah, garlic. I'm doing a, a, a live seminar about garlic in... in October on October 22nd but um and that's on Facebook it's no this one's live it's I I'm not sure it's going to be taped but we'll see okay anyway there is a handout that you have and you can uh, send that out with photographs as well as uh explanation um garlic is planted the end of in our area since this is going everywhere, and who knows where you are. Garlic grows underground, basically. So uh, it needs to be underground in a very cold environment because the roots are growing underground. Same with the bulbs. So flower bulbs as well as garlic bulbs. Then in the springtime, you start seeing the uh, garlic chives come up. You don't want to cut those. Because they're, well, 
No. You want to let those keep going because in um, June you're going to get garlic scapes. It's a nice curlicue, and it's round, and it's it's delicious. It's a green-tasting garlic. And then in July, the foliage, all the foliage starts to um, die back, and you know that it's time to harvest, usually around um, July 15th, around there. That's when you harvest your garlic, and uh, you let it dry for a good three to five days to have a nice uh, crusty outside, which protects it. Mm -hmm. So you can store it for a whole six, eight months in a cool, dry place. Yeah. Um, Garlic is a wonderful thing to plant around the perimeter of your vegetable garden or flower garden, even your uh, around your rose bushes. Mm Mm-hmm. Because it will keep voles and moles from uh, burrowing underground and protect your your plants. Okay. Uh, another thing you can plant at this time of year are uh, chives, either by seed or by plant. And again, planting those around your garden would be wonderful uh, because they keep out the crawling critters. Um Anything that would be grazing as it goes along, like woodchucks and... Uh, yeah, I have. If you look up by the fence, I have garlic chives along the perimeter ah, of the fence. That's so wonderful. So they can't burrow under. That's right. And they're, it's wonderful. I love it. Garlic chives, regular chives, uh, Egyptian onions, all should go around the perimeter of your garden. That'll keep out the woodchucks. And the gophers, the voles and moles, anything that'll burrow. Bunny rabbits. I love the animals. I really do. But you don't want them eating your stuff. (laughs) You can share a little. I do. I do. Okay. So um, anything else to wrap up the winter garden um, planting? As long as you mulch with leaves or straw... But um, I think you're safer to mulch with leaves. That'll uh, build up the nutrients in the soil, also help the biodiversity, especially the earthworm population, which will then aerate the soil. And then in the springtime, uh, for the vegetable garden, I don't bother removing any of it because it's only about an inch and a half deep. So all the volunteer plants from the seeds that have dropped the the previous year can get up through it you just plant through it you just open up a little hole with your finger plant your seed or your little plant and you're good to go and you won't expose any of the weed seeds to the air yeah okay so you don't take it you don't clean it off no. you just dig a hole and plant right through it right hey i like that my tomato gardens especially if I'm a lazy gardener, and if some of my tomatoes have fallen off the branches and onto the soil, um, it's no problem. I just cover them over with the leaves for the winter. And then in June sometime, I start seeing the little sprouts of hardy tomato plants, and they're going to be the best tomato plants of the entire year. Mm. No matter where I get them. So you don't pull them out. You just let them go. Yeah, I let them go or I'll transplant them with a very big root, root ball. Okay. Um, to where they'd be more suited. Now, do you rotate your crops or do you put the same thing in the same plant from year to year? Um, I do not rotate only because I've got volunteer plants coming up. Oh, because I rotate, but it's a pain because if I have calendula, the yeah. flowers have gone to seed. Right. Then, then I end up having volunteers when I put my tomatoes. Right. Or like this year, I had calendula plants mixed in with my tomatoes. Right. Now, if you're not rotating, that means you have to be careful of the soil quality. Mm-hmm. Because if you're doing tomatoes every year, which are heavy feeders... Uh, you need to add a lot of composted manure, preferably uh, cow manure or uh, two-year-aged horse manure or um, two-year-aged chicken manure, something of that nature. Uh, if you're fortunate enough to raise bunny rabbits, 
their manure can go straight into anything. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I used to have a bunny rabbit. She was great. Oh, yeah. Um, but uh, that's the thing, that if you don't feed the soil, you won't get the healthy crops. Uh, and you just have to remember to feed the soil, not the plant. That's why the chemical fertilizers aren't so good, because they feed the plants and not the soil. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's you're going to deplete all the nutrients from the soil, and you'll never get complete nutrition for your plants Yeah. otherwise. Yeah. So I like to make sure that I give a healthy head start by mulching with leaves. Have you heard that before? <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't. Okay, so let's switch to fall cleanup. What are the things, um, I see you got a list here. So let's talk about the garden and then move to lawn care and then the shrubs and trees. All right. If you've got a vegetable garden, uh, at this time of year, which is the end of September, I keep watering it if anything is still growing. I'm still getting tomatoes and occasionally a, a cucumber, so I keep watering. And my watermelons are still doing well, which reminds me I have to go thump a melon and see what's available. Um, anyway, um, remove your vegetable plants as they die back. But, of course, you can leave any dropped uh, food, and through the winter, the seeds will just nestle down into the soil and be volunteer plants next year. Uh, I also like to save my seeds from anything that has stayed on the uh, vine and um, has turned brown. The seed pots are in there, and I'll save those and save the seeds, and then I can plant them next year because I already know they're, they're viable and uh, very good uh, varieties. And if they, the ones that come up through the winter, you know that if they've made it through the winter, they're certainly going to make it through the summer. Okay. All right. Now, the um, annuals. If you have uh, annual flowers, I only cut back those that aren't looking good. And a lot of the annuals will uh, spit out seeds. So I will uh, pick up the seeds, and I might even plant them this fall where I'd like to see them next year. And the others I'll just save and dry and put them in a paper envelope and label it so I can plant some more. But if I plant them now and they winter over, I'm going to have wonderful plants that are going to be very sturdy. Mm, nice. With the um, perennials, when they start looking poorly, that's when I cut them back. The others I'll let stay uh, because it fills in and makes it look green and lush for the rest of the season. If it's nice weather through December, I mean, yes. sometimes we have beautiful weather. You don't touch your, your perennials. That's you, right. You just let them go and tell. It could be December 25th. You That's right. You still let them go. That's right. Okay. And it's also better for them to be building up the energy for next year. Um, the foliage is taking in what sunshine we do have and um, is helping to clean the air. And then the nice bird I hear. Isn't that good? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, the um, uh, perennials will just keep going and building up their energy for next year. And then when it finally gets cold enough for each of the perennials to die back, all that energy goes down into the root system. And then through the winter, the roots will continue to grow and build so that next spring they'll come up vigorously. I cut down my stalks to about six to eight inches mm -hmm. so that in the springtime when the new foliage is coming up, any predators who want to eat some fresh greens will have their nose poked. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Okay, so what about uh, you have vegetables, herbs, any shrubs? Shrubs. Any shrubs that are blooming in the late summer or, or fall can be pruned during that time. The best time to prune any shrub or tree is when it's blooming. Okay. Because that's when it's setting its buds for next year. 
this is not a good time for pruning back conifers, anything that's green uh, and will stay green, because um, if you prune back too much, uh, it won't have any insulation from the cold weather. Yeah. So you want to leave those alone until the spring. Okay. Uh, again, with shrubs, I like to pile the, the leaves underneath the shrubs as much as I can. The bulbs uh, that might be uh, there or the perennials that are in between the shrubs will come right up through the leaves. Mm -hmm. And in the springtime in uh, late February, you just loosen it with a pitchfork. Okay. Lawn care. Um, if you have a nice lawn and if you mow your lawn or have a service, drop your blade down to about an inch, inch and a half, probably an inch and a half. And... Um, that would probably be your last cut. In the fall, it grows so quickly. In the warm days and the cool nights. Yeah. That um, any further growth will probably not be um, dramatic. Yeah, I know. Paul leaves his lawnmower high. He cuts it, I think, at a two, two and a half inch. Yeah. In the summertime, it's very important to keep it uh, about three or four inches deep. But uh, to protect from the uh, blazing sun, the yep. heat wave, and the and the drought. But in the fall, mm -hmm. with the cool weather, um, you need to bring it down. Also, it makes it so much easier to rake the lawn. Well, he he doesn't he has a mulcher, so we we have a, a lawnmower that does the mulching for you. Ah. so we there's no bagging, and when if the leaves. The blow into the grass. Yes. He just mows right over them and it mulches them right into the grass. That's good until the leaves get too thick because... Well, we don't have trees anymore. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, but if the, the leaves do get too thick, then you have to rake them. And that's when you bag them up. Yeah. And save them for your mulch or your compost. And this time of year, I bag up as many bags of leaves and store them mm -hmm. for next summer. Wow. Because we need bags for uh, bags of leaves for mulching in the yeah. spring and the fall and the summer. Um, and, the, and then we also need bags of leaves for the composting. Mm -hmm. And we don't have leaves in the springtime. No. They've all disappeared because they've decomposed or blown into the woods. So, uh, and even the leaves in the woods are uh, decomposed. Yeah. So I save my leaves. In big bags, and I push them down, and I don't mulch them up. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a big leaf time, and I don't give them away. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, this is the time to rake your lawn. Uh, I rake the lawns um, just to get rid of any thatch that might have mm -hmm. built up and uh, any crabgrass that might have been left over. Then... Um, I spread lawn, lime and gypsum. We In New England, we have naturally acid soil. So I spread lime on my lawns, on all of the lawn. Uh, I stay away from the pine trees because they need an acid soil. Um, and anywhere that you want violets or you want moss, you don't put lime on it. Then violets you can harvest in the spring. <laughs> Put them in your salad. Yeah, that's exactly what I do. I love my violets and 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 dandelions. Oh, da oh, dandelion greens. Love they love dandelion greens. They're in the sunny acid soil. So if you want dandelions, don't lime. <laughs> yeah, no, I I've been known to uh, go to my neighbor's yard because I know they don't they don't use chemicals on their right. yard. And uh, neighbors see me, they're driving up the street, and they see me digging digging out the dandelions in their yard. And they're, and they're like, what are you doing, lady? And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Dandelions are a great diuretic. That's right. They help if you are naturally retain water, eat your dandelion roots and greens because you it's a great natural water pill. That's true. And it's also full of good nutrients. Yes, vitamin C, A, tons of stuff. Good, yes. And um, there are 
I heard from another herbalist that there are 34 different uses for dandelions. Oh, there's a ton. There's a yeah. ton. It's one of the go-to uh, herbs in, in our toolkits. Do you know... The dandelions were originally brought here by the Europeans for both medicinal and um, culinary. Yeah, I knew that. Same as plantain that's not native yeah, to America nope, either. They're not native, but um, and people complain about them in the lawns, but if they only knew. Because I cultivate them over at the Spruce Street Community Garden. Yeah, no. But, um, and people think I'm crazy, but then I explain and they say, oh, but see, this is marketing. I think this is where we got brainwashed yeah. from the chemical companies. Yes. Um, because, well, I remember my grandmother. Yes. My grandmother during the Depression, well, she, I was visiting my grandmother in Michigan, and she was horrified that at her condo unit there were dandelions growing in the grass. Oh. I never saw anybody so unnerved about dandelions like she was and yes. she would march out to that grass and she would pull up these dandelions and the poor groundskeeping people when they showed up to mow the lawn she would give them an earful about allowing dandelions to grow in the grass and it wasn't until years later that I realized that she was a depression era baby and Chances are she ate dandelions because that was what was able to grow. Right. And so it, to her, that signified with going without or oh. poor. So I think a lot of that is, um, is, is from that, that time period that it was uh, just, you know, it represented to her as being, being poor. And she wasn't poor. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but to her, that was a sign of, you know, people people ate dandelions because they didn't have money. They didn't have a way to feed them their family. Do you know people pay for dandelion greens right now? Well, I buy them at Whole Foods. Yeah, but also, they're in the spring mix. Mm. The spring mm -hmm. salad greens. Yeah, she's probably doing a few flips in her coffin at the moment. Yeah. Because of Dan, I mean, I had no idea until I became an herbalist and yeah. I started researching and doing plant profiles for my studies that I realized the dandelions, and I also, because, uh, you know, certain times of the month, you tend to retain water, and I yeah. was gaining, I would gain up to like 20 pounds. Oh, that can't be. And, um, I would, I started taking dandelion root, the ah. ground up root. You can buy it in the capsule form. And I would shed, I would start shedding the water. And um, I had a long talk with my gynecologist about it. And she was like, do it, go for it. That's, That's great. What we need, we need women to do more of yes. instead of looking for a prescription to That's fix that correct. problem. Yeah. yeah. Balance your system. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> But it's good. People need to know this, you know. Yes. Um, and it's important to know what is free food around us. Yes. Uh, in the springtime, dandelion greens are very sweet and tender mm -hmm. before they go to flower. After that, you have to cook them up uh, like other greens with um, a little bit of garlic and onion. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have a friend of mine who does dandelion greens with olive oil and salt and pepper. Oh, and she's Greek. Yes. And um, I started doing that. It's a bitter. So in the spring, they're nice and tender and That's sweet. That's correct. But in the winter or in the late fall, it's their bitters, which is a great, helps with the digestive juices. And again, it helps oh. with weight loss. You know, you need those bitters, those bitter herbs, kale, broccoli. That helps with those digestive juices to get things moving and a good colon care. Wow. Um, so, yeah, there's tons. I mean, I love my greens, man. I love those dandelion greens. And, I yes, I buy them in the grocery store. Yes. You know, an awful lot of people buy them and don't even know it. And the, look at the um, the different greens in your spring mix. Mm -hmm. You'll find interesting things. <laughs> yeah, who knew? Uh, so if you want dandelions in your in your yard, don't use pelletized lime. But the uh, or violets. Violets are in shady acid soil. Um, I 
leave my violet greens along the edge of the sidewalk at, at in my uh, front porch. Mm-hmm. And uh, they are tasty snacks in the springtime. Mm-hmm. Um, but also the, the flowers are delicious. But we're talking about winter care. Um, now, gypsum is another mineral, and you can get it in pelletized form, uh, that goes along um, the roadside or your sidewalk or the um, driveway where the road salt might go, and it will neutralize road salt, pet damage, and chemical problems. If you have been treating your lawn with chemicals, but if you have been treating your lawn with chemicals and you want to get it off the drugs, because chemicals are a drug, um, uh, that's why you have to add things on a regular basis. If you want to go organic, using gypsum on your lawn will help to... um, detox your lawn. Also, it uh, decreases the problems you'll have with road salt, Mm -hmm. pet damage, and compacted soil. Yeah. I just really wish people would not do that. We see trucks every day driving up and down our street. But we live in the conditions we are, and these are some organic ways you can deal with it. Yeah. Get rid of the grass! No, well... (laughs) Plant flowers for the pollinators. Come on. Well, we yes. need, you need, yeah, yeah. We need flowers. True. We need living yards, not these green carpets. Lawns began because a landscape architect visited Europe and saw what appeared to be lawn around uh, the castles. And he thought how beautiful it was. He didn't bother noticing that there were sheep and goats to graze and uh, keep down all the vegetation. And the purpose of having all that open space was to protect the residents of the castles from um, incoming invaders. Mm -hmm. They couldn't hide in the shrubs and the trees and so forth. So um, they thought, well, wouldn't this be a wonderful thing? So in the 50s, when they started doing the uh, plan developments, yeah, the plan developments, they said, let's have a nonstop lawn going through Mm. the whole development. So that's where Keeping Up with the Joneses came through. (laughs) Yeah, and we're all slaves to an industry. Right. Um, I I do a three-hour class on lawn care. (laughs) Take her class, people. (laughs) Yeah. Um, There'll be a video on that coming soon. Okay, what else? Indoor gardening. Uh, This winter, if you don't want to be gardening outside, why not garden inside? Using window boxes or other containers... uh, right near your windows. You don't need any special lighting. You don't need any special containers or or heat lamps or anything. Because if you um, just grow lettuce varieties, spinach, and, and radishes, you'll have your own salad greens all winter. Um, you start with um, window boxes filled with potting soil and a little bit of good compost but no more than five, the compost should not be more than 5% of the whole of the soil structure. Um, And you mix it all together, make sure it's moist, not dripping wet, but just moist. Otherwise, it'll take all the um, moisture from the seeds. So to the moist soil, you're going to plant your lettuce varieties and spinach and radishes. Then um, you water them with a mister bottle, so you're not going to drench them. And they won't be moving around for the first week. Then you mist them in the morning and then again in the evening. So it's not going to be too deep. Then uh, the second week, you can water in the mornings uh, with a regular sprinkler watering can. Within about uh, 8 to 10 days, you'll see the sprouts starting to come up. And you'll be able to tell who is going to be too close to someone else. So when they're tall enough for you to pick... Even if you use tweezers, you can pull out the ones that are too close together and throw them in a little bowl of water and um, to get the, the soil off them and then just eat them. They're sprouts. They're delicious. They're yeah. packed with all kinds of nutrition. And then those plants that you've chosen to leave there, when the foliage is large enough, uh, you just take the larger leaves mm-hmm. and leave the smaller leaves so they can continue to um, grow for three months and you just keep harvesting the larger leaves and let everything else keep growing and you water in the morning, not at night. 
you're probably wondering why just in the morning. And I'm going to tell you, because if you water at night, the plants are sleeping at night. Okay. And they're not going to drink the water, but the mold and mildew will love you. Yeah. So let's avoid mold and mildew, especially in a closed Mm -hmm. environment. Um, You can add a drop of lemon-scented dishwashing liquid to the uh, watering Mm -hmm. can, and that will be like a wetting agent, helping the water to go a little deeper and a little more thoroughly through the potting soil so the potting soil doesn't pull away from the edges of your container. That's good for any of your house plants, by the way, because um, you don't have the regular biodiversity in your soil that will keep it all fluffed up. Mm -hmm. So if you have a little bit of the lemon-scented dishwashing liquid, preferably not (laughs) antibacterial, it will uh, keep your soil nice and fluffy. That'll go for about three months. And then when you feel like it, you can go outside and do your harvesting of your winter yeah, crops yeah. that also don't need any any uh, covering. Do you know you can do sprouts yep. in a jar or you can do your microgreens? I have the kit on Etsy, everybody. Just go on Etsy. I shipped all over the United States. For those of us who are not familiar with Esty, what is Etsy, it? E-S-T-Y. It's a, um, it's a website that people can sell on. Uh, cra- it's you, it started for crafters. Oh. So they do a lot of the marketing. It's a, like a marketplace. It's kind of like the Amazon for crafters. Oh. Unfortunately, they allowed commercial businesses to post stuff. So the market is significantly diluted by commercial products. So I I have a store on there. Um, so now you're a commercial product. N- no, be no. I'm considered <laughs> I'm considered a handmade per- product, but I'm ah. mixed in with commercial, you know, manufacturers. Okay, so you look at some of the jewelry. You look at some of the higher end products. Like you probably could buy a wood stove. Well, that's commercially manufactured, and right. so they're selling it on Etsy. Um, and uh, it, it dilutes the market to the, when you have ha- more competition, which I correct. don't agree. It's like almost eBay. You know, if you've heard of eBay, right? Oh, yes. So, um, yeah, I, under my farm to bath, uh, store, I have the Thompson street farm microgreens and I, I only sell two kits, um, the peas and the kale and maybe one other, and the arugula I sell. And everything's oh. included. It's a it's a tray with the special potting soil that I, I get here, which does well. Not all potting soil microgreens do well in. Yes, that's true. So, and then I give you um, some seeds now because of the, the pandemic. I'm doubling the seeds. So you should... Yes. If you just get um, standard shipping or standard uh, seeds, you get enough for two to three growings, depending on how thick you you, you seed mm-hmm. your tray. I'm giving you double. So you That's should wonderful. have at least four, maybe five to six, depending on how, how thick you, you plant your seeds. Only because I know that seed companies, they're out of stock. And yes. you couldn't get seeds if you wanted to early in this spring. So people plan early. I hope that all those people who stocked up on their seeds and other planting materials are actually using them. I discovered this year that by August, most people gave up on their vegetable gardens because mm-hmm. it was too much work. It is a lot of work. But I want to encourage people, keep it up. Don't stop because... Well, but also don't ex- have your expectations in check. Yes. If you can't take care of this big garden, then go smaller. Don't go bigger. That's right. I always say start small and then build on it. And if you had too big of a garden that you started with this year, this is the time to start thinking about how to modify it for mm-hmm. next year. Don't give yeah. up. Don't give up. Um, I have four videos coming up in the next four months. Well, in November, it's putting your garden to bed for winter. So we'll be viewing a few of these things and you'll see the month okay. of November. And now the, that's when it's going to be put up. But these will be available on the Spruce Street Community okay. Garden Facebook page. Um, in December, it's going to be stocking up for winter. All the things you need to know so you will be sustainable in your own home for the next year or two. Then in early January, growing food indoors. Ooh. So if you've forgotten some of these things and you were kind of busy in the holidays, you can be reminded of how to go Betty's got you covered. All right. And then in late February, 
starting plants from seed. Ooh, okay. And then after that, we'll see what we can okay, do. Okay, Betty Lou, those are great topic. If you sign up for my newsletter, my uh, LLH newsletter, every week I'm going through Betty Lou's paperwork, her, her handouts, her free handouts, and reposting little snippets from her handouts and re- having links back to her and all her Facebook pages um, for the video. So I'll keep doing that. So make sure you sign up for my LLH uh, Five Herb Friday newsletter and I'll keep adding Betty Lou's stuff to it because again this is a a passion of mine is to teach gardening to get people everybody should have should be growing something whether it's in the house or in a garden or on a deck or even on your front stoop you know in a milk crate you can grow something um and having feeding yourself is important especially now with all the craziness that's going on because you know what this is only phase one there may be two phase two three and the experts around the world are saying 2022 we could be dealing with this so plan now. Now's the time to plan. You can build your own food system right in your own yard. I have frame raised beds in my front yard and many, many people in our community are doing the same yeah. thing. We still have perennial flowers. We pl- still have flowering shrubs and trees. It's beautiful, but we also are growing food in the front yard if that's the only place you have some. Yeah, absolutely. And if, and if you don't have that, you know, check out your local community gardens. Absolutely. They're they're all over the United States. I don't... All over the world. The world, okay. All over the world. um, And if you don't have one near where you live, you can start one. All you need is a few other families or individuals to join with you. Find a little piece of land that isn't being used and go for it. I always ask permission Um, of the owner if you don't own it. (laughs) Well, yes. There's a little legal, legal issues here. I will provide for you my document about how to start a community oh, garden. Okay. It goes quite a few pages, but um and but it gives very practical questions that you ask yourself about how you want to go about it, where you want it to be, uh who owns the land, what the water source will be and so forth. Um these are building community all over the world and even in cities, New York City, for instance, is big on community gardens. Yeah. They have them in every vacant lot or on, on rooftops, yeah. and they're really uh, making a difference. And most mm-hmm. cities have a plan for community gardens yeah. these days. Um, I myself am, am working with six different organizations to start community gardens in our Wonderful. town. And we have four started already, and others are, are going to... Uh, grow beyond that. In the city of Hartford, Connecticut, right here in in Connecticut, they have 22 community gardens Mm -hmm. within the city limits, plus two farms within the city limits. And there are a lot of apartment buildings there, a lot of businesses Mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, And it's a a busy city, but they managed to turn parking lots into community gardens. If you've never been to Hartford, I mean, I used to work in Hartford for over 10 years and it was a desert, a food desert. There was just only, if you wanted food, yeah, you had to go to a restaurant. Well, they had, um, I know in the 70s, there was only a handful of of small grocery stores left, and they were charging an arm and a leg for very poor quality food in very dirty conditions. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's when the community garden system first started, mm-hmm. uh, because they and with the immigrant population, it was even more popular yeah. because most people come to the come to the United States, and nobody will recognize their culture, but the Earth will. Yeah. And once they get their hands in the uh, soil. And there's a wonderful book written by a Connecticut author called The Earth Knows My wow. Name. Interviewed a hundred different immigrants mm-hmm. about their gardening experience and uh, put down um, 20 of them in this incredible book. Uh, it's very inspiring. The Earth Knows My Name. I will have a link uh, to the book in the show notes. If anybody wants to check it out, the link will be um, to Amazon um, if anybody's interested. Good. 
I think that's excellent. Thank and you very much. It'll be in much. my uh, r- list of recommended books in my resource page as well. But thank you for that for that um, sure that recommendation. All right. So, um, anything else? I have one question here about: Do we fertilize during the winter? No, no. fertilizing. Okay, no fertilizing. Especially if you're going to be uh, mulching with leaves. Let the earthworms and biodiversity okay. do it. <laughs> I don't like to spend oh, money. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Uh, do I need any special tools or equipment for a fall or winter garden? Uh, a rake for raking your lawn. Um, in, for leaves, the bamboo rakes are the best because they're lightweight um, and they're real. Um, the plastic rakes can break and too easily and uh, they're too rough on the grass. Um, I don't use blowers or power equipment. Uh, the blowers will blow away all the topsoil and um, the good earthworm poop. Yeah, no, <laughs> we're worth. Yeah, so um, I use rakes. It's a good exercise. And uh, one of the benefits of the upper body exercise, you rake with one side of your body for a while and then you switch mm-hmm. over to the other side of your body and so you get a total upper body workout there you go you're also able to go a lot longer <laughs> that way <laughs> unless you have people which we don't have it's us that's yeah, it yeah that's good all right betty lou thank you so much for my uh, pleasure for this and um wow my mind is spinning this is great. Well, thank you so much for having oh, me again. thank you. This, this was a lot of fun. I hope we can do Absolutely. it again. Absolutely. Well, you know, we're not done yet because and I, I, if you're up for it, we still need to talk about historic gardens. Ah. You know, you've mentioned on many occasions the Cheney Homestead Museum. And we need to talk about your work there and historic gardens and how you've been instrumental in restoring the homestead's uh, gardens to their time period, and and that's another topic for another day, and uh, but I I want to I want to get into that as well in a well, few, future uh, future show that would include living without electricity. Well, you know, you know we <laughs> I just came back camping from Vermont. It was. It was a lot of fun. And you know, yeah. I, well, I, you people don't know this, but you know, I, I think I'm living in the wrong, wrong century, I think, but right. that's okay. I've often been told that <laughs> about myself. <laughs> but you know, as I was telling my husband, and this is for you listeners, you know, it's good to have these skills, learning how to grow yes. your own food, learning how to, even if you live in an apartment, what do you do? when there is no electricity and water how how would you be able to care for your family regardless where you are where you live and i know in cities spaces are small resources are 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 limited but today with the power of the internet you can lots of things that are small that are compact and i was telling betty lou about this little tiny wood stove that i somebody mentioned in a vi- in a youtube video it was this tiny little rv that they drilled a hole for the the pipe and um she she just put it on the table on the counter and they had heat now i'm not saying that you should do that in your apartment because you're going to probably kill yourself and cause a fire however there are lots of really unique resources out there that will fit your needs all you just need is an internet connection the libraries have free internet for you um and and if you keep listening i'll be sharing some of that stuff so all right (laughs) thank you betty lou and until next time thank you Thank you, Betty Lou, for taking the time to talk about gardening with us. I look forward to catching your videos on Facebook. If you didn't catch all the dates, I'll have them listed in the show notes as well. Make sure you download her garden handouts if you haven't done it already. There are lots of great information, and even though I'm a seasoned garden, I still forget things and go back and review her class notes. They are that detailed. 
Also, go over to her Facebook page and follow her. And don't forget to say hello and send her some love. Betty Lou needs love. We always got to send some love to our guests. So please do that. If you're wondering when and where her videos will be posted, they will be on the Spruce Street Community Garden Facebook page. Again, links in the show notes. Here's what she has planned so far. So November, she's going to be doing uh, putting your garden to bed for the winter. In December, stocking up for your winter, everything you need to know so you will be sustainable for a year or two. January, growing food indoors. And February, starting plants from seed. So don't forget to sign up for a Five Herb Friday newsletter. It's the best way to stay in touch with me and participate on my journey through the world of herbs and your journey as well, because I also give you plant profiles and all kinds of other little goodies. And also, if you're enjoying these podcasts, how about send me some love and give me a thumbs up on whatever service or platform you're hearing this show on. And also don't forget uh, Facebook and Instagram are the best places to find me. So I hope you have a great week and thanks for listening and I'll see you next time. Hi everyone, it's Brenda again. Just a few more things before you take off. On Fridays, I'll post a quick newsletter called Five Herb Friday, sharing five things related to the world of herbs. It could be a cool recipe, a cool idea for using herbs around your home, a DIY bath and body product, a gadget, a book, or an article or website I found helpful and think you might enjoy it too. It will be short, to the point, and full of good positive energy that will send you off for an awesome weekend. So go to livingandlovingherbs.com and sign up for this short email. This episode was brought to you by farmtobath.com, where our bath and body products are inspired by nature. Farm to Bath makes beautiful handcrafted goat smoke soaps, body room sprays, sugar scrubs, salves, balms, and body oils using the herbs, flowers, fruits, and vegetables grown in our garden. There are no preservatives, additives, dyes, or fillers. We use sustainable growing practices that are chemical-free and GMO-free. This is just for our listeners of Living and Loving Herbs podcast. We're offering a buy one, get one free on our goat's milk herbal soaps. This offer is only for our podcast listeners. Just type in the promotion code LLH podcast at checkout. The code again is LLH podcast. Go to farmtobath.com and check out our products and don't forget to order your soap. Until next time, have a happy and blessed day and thank you for listening.